This video is brought to you by the Eno 3D range of RTX 30 series graphics cards. Okay, so it's 2012. What do we got here? We got uh, it's uh, we got Gundam style. That's that's big at the moment. We got uh, the ain't nobody got time for that lady. She's been discovered. Uh, Obama's president. I remember that guy. Uh, the Avengers is out as well. And the Dark Knight Rises. Remember when we weren't tired of superhero films? We were all rocking the iPhone 5 while Microsoft was still trying to make the Windows phone a thing. I mean, look at this. How did they think this was ever going to work? And amidst all of the craziness of 2012, an independent games developer from Poland put up a little teaser trailer telling us what they were working on next. The developer was CD Projekt Red, a company that famously started out with booths like this and ended up hosting booths like this, a company that started out translating genre-defining RPGs like Baldur's Gate into Polish that would one day go on to make its own genre-defining RPG in the Witcher series. It's a company that started from nothing and now has more market capitalization and value than the likes of Ubisoft, despite having only a fraction of their infrastructure, staff, and IP. It's been a long journey for CD Projekt Project Red, but it's felt like an equally long journey for us as we all patiently waited for them to make Cyberpunk. We probably hadn't started the college degrees we've since graduated from. We probably hadn't met the husbands and wives we are now married to. We probably fit into pants we now look at with utter puzzlement, thinking, what the fuck? Whose pants were these? Time has moved slowly, but anticipation for Cyberpunk has not, with the hype for the game growing exponentially year on year. From the cinematic teaser trailer in 2013, to the cinematic reveal trailer in 2018, to the steady release of gameplay and trailers since then, the hype has built and built and built, reaching an absolute peak at the news that planet Earth's favorite son, Keanu Reeves, would be joining the game as a cyber ghost living in your head. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that never before in the history of video games has any title been so eagerly anticipated, so built up, so hyped. Cyberpunk was somehow supposed to simultaneously be the best written game of all time, the greatest RPG of all time, the best open world game of all time, the best looking game of all time, have the most player choice ever, more branching storylines than any game before it, and finally usher in the long-awaited Penis 2, sequel to the ambitious but ultimately underwhelming Penis 1. I'm here today to tell you what you already know, which is that no game could live up to that level of hype. It's impossible. But the good news is that Cyberpunk 2077 absolutely delivers on high expectations. If you had high expectations for a truly incredible open world to explore and get lost in, Cyberpunk 2077 delivers. If you had high expectations for dazzling spectacle and set piece moments, Cyberpunk 2077 delivers. If you had high expectations for a technical tour de force that raises the bar for what video games will look like in the future, Cyberpunk 2077 delivers. If you had expectations of a world full of stories and characters that draw you in and engage you, Cyberpunk 2077 delivers. And if you had expectations for fucking cool futuristic combat where you shoot people with your cyber guns and hack into their cyber brains, Cyberpunk 2077 delivers. But Cyberpunk doesn't deliver in every regard, and in some areas, it let me down. I think the best way to summarize this game is to say that it's an extraordinary open world action game, but it's a far weaker RPG. While the skill trees are expansive and provide you with a huge number of options, the majority of these options are simple stat bonuses that feel unsophisticated and uninteresting. The entire gear game is like a looter shooter where you're picking up and tossing away items based on their rarities and their deep PS stats rather than tweaking them through modification to arrive at something unique to your playstyle. The combat framework is really not designed to properly leverage all the skills at your disposal, with most of it being the familiar distract, stealth, or shoot you've probably seen before. The entire crafting economy is broken, rendering that entire play path a waste of time and resources, and I know from experience because I chose the crafting path. The broader game economy is similarly dysfunctional, limiting your access to vehicles and upgrades unless you grind huge amounts of side content. The biggest issue though are the bugs. This game was famously delayed multiple times, including most recently after an ironclad promise that it would not be delayed again. I can tell you right now, this game should have been delayed again. It should have been delayed until probably March of next year. The number of bugs I encountered in my playthrough was huge, just huge. I have dozens and dozens of clips cataloging every manner of bug, many of them minor, but some of them quite major, some of them quite game-breaking 
causing crashes, forcing me to restart, and spoiling critical moments in the game for me. It's a real shame that this is the case, because I firmly believe that Cyberpunk is, in its most critical aspects, extraordinary. Never before have you been to a place like Night City. Never before have you lived the life you will live here as V. Never before have I felt so subsumed by a game as though when I booted up the game on my PC, it was like I was putting on a VR headset and just being spirited away. Night City is an absolute marvel and whatever shortcomings the game has, the promise of Night City is always there and it keeps you going. City Project Red had a rather funny way of revealing Cyberpunk 2077's gameplay. They did so at E3 2018 in a behind closed door session where selected media and content creators were invited. I was invited to one of those sessions and I saw the footage you're seeing here now. And the first thing I said when I walked out of the theater was, there is absolutely no way in hell this game is going to run on current gen consoles. Fast forward to two years and I still can't properly answer that question for you. We've seen gameplay running on the PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, and it looks fine, but we have to take this footage with a grain of salt since CD Projekt Red are only going to select clips that show the game off in the best possible light. At the time of writing this review, we still haven't seen how this game runs on base PS4 models and on the Xbox One S, except for leaked clips which have been taken down. Reviewers were told that no console code would be made available and that we were only allowed to review the game on PC, which frankly is bullshit. Long story short, if you have a last gen console, I can't tell you how this game runs there because no one can because CD Projekt Red didn't want us to tell you. I can speak about performance on PC, and for reference, I have an RTX 3080 and an AMD 5950X. So my PC is basically a benchmark PC. You can't really buy better consumer hardware than this, and my most recent 3D Mark results tell me that my PC is in the top 1% of PCs in the market. Now, I'm not saying this to flex, by the way. For some reason, people always think I'm flexing when I list specs. I'm not. I do it so that you know what I have, and it gives you a sense of how this game performs on top-end hardware, right? First of all, there's the PC options menu, which is extensive. From a sound perspective, you can set the dynamic range for a variety of different audio environments, including headphones, speakers, TV speakers, and straight up studio reference. There is controller support for this game with the option to tweak dead zones, which is nice. When the controller support works, it works well, and it may actually be the best way to play this game. Cyberpunk isn't a Twitch shooter or whatever, so during combat, the shooting feels fine since there's some generous auto aim that kicks in to help you. More importantly, you're going to spend a lot of time driving. Driving on a keyboard and mouse is really unpleasant here, whereas I found it okay when using a controller. If you don't want to use a controller during the combat and broader gameplay, you may want to at least have one handy and switch over to it when you're driving. It really does make that big a difference. Sadly, for me at least, the controller support was extremely buggy when I was using an Xbox controller. I had a recurring issue where certain buttons and directions on the controller would simply cease to work, so I could accelerate in my car, but I couldn't turn left or right. The only way to fix this was to restart the game. I did this half a dozen times before I got over it and just played the whole thing on a keyboard and mouse. That means I never really enjoyed driving as much as I could have, which is a big shame. Returning to the menu, you have plenty of options to tweak or Away, since some people just don't like it while others like more of it. There's a crowd density toggle here which matters because accidentally hitting pedestrians with your car or shooting them in the streets will get the cops after you, sort of, so having less bystanders makes the game a little bit easier. This is also where you'll find the nudity sensor toggle, but who the hell is going to turn that off? Getting to the good stuff, the graphical settings. They've got a, uh, there's a lot here, okay? There are some quick presets you can apply if you're inclined, but you can also tweak a few dozen variables below. Field of view is in and you can max it to 100, which I found to be more than fine. There's a film grain option here, which I recommend turning off because you're probably going to turn on DLSS when you're playing and that already applies a sort of blurriness or graininess. I found having both of these enabled to be just too much, so my recommendation is to switch it off. Plenty of other settings here to toy with to your heart's content, but the most important ones are down the bottom, ray tracing and DLSS. Now, 
ray tracing is a very, very big deal in Cyberpunk 2077. You can see a comparison shot here of what it looks like turned on versus off, and the difference is night and day. Cyberpunk looks absolutely stunning with ray tracing turned off, but it looks extraordinary with ray tracing on, as each new location, each new surface seems to take on a whole new life. This is the most ambitious and complete implementation of ray tracing we've ever seen in a video game, and Night City simply isn't the same city with ray tracing turned off. But this graphical feature does come at a significant cost. Playing at 1440p with everything set to ultra, ray tracing on, but DLSS off, I got an average of like 30 frames, and that would drop lower than that quite frequently. And that's in my, you know, like top end, top 1% hardware, 30 frames a second. So obviously that sucks. Why would any PC player want to play at 30 frames a second? DLSS is basically hard carrying Cyberpunk's PC performance. When I turn on DLSS, I immediately double my frame rate with an only minimal loss of image quality. The loss is mainly in a sort of blurriness that kicks in, which you can't really see up close, but it's far more noticeable at a distance. There's also an issue where wet surfaces would shimmer and look really awful when DLSS is enabled, but a future patch note from CD Projekt Red said that this will be fixed. We'll have to see for ourselves whether or not this is true when that patch is deployed. Bottom line though, is that on my hardware with ray tracing enabled and DLSS set to quality, I was able to get an average of around 70 frames in interior spaces and during cutscenes, and around 50 to 60 frames when driving through the city. I got half that with DLSS off. It's no surprise to me then that it was recently announced that AMD GPUs will not support ray tracing at launch since DLSS is exclusive to Nvidia at the moment. AMD are working on a DLSS equivalent that will likely be out next year. My strong advice to anyone sporting a fancy new AMD card is to wait until that tech is deployed and ray tracing is enabled for AMD cards in Cyberpunk once again because you really don't want to miss this. Speaking more broadly, I found Cyberpunk's performance to be a mixed bag. Frame rates are generally quite steady, but there are a lot of other issues that speak to how unfinished this game is. The way the game handles light is a big one. Some scenes are so awash with light that it looks like it hasn't been balanced correctly. One shootout was so bright and red that I could barely see what was going on. Often when driving in first person mode, the road was just too bright and I couldn't actually see anything. I found one graphical setting that sort of turned off all of the lights for some reason. There's a lot of light being thrown around in this game and it's clear that some more work needs to be done to iron out some of these kinks. There's also a lot of issues with pop-in while driving. If you pay attention to the distance you're going to see lots of items, textures and lighting suddenly popping in. The desert is odd because there seems to be ghost cars everywhere that appear and disappear in the distance based on how close you get. Even internal spaces can suffer from shadow pop-in pretty regularly. There are also quite a few issues with audio which often seems unmixed or unfinished. I'd probably a dozen sequences or cutscenes where audio was missing altogether or missing certain parts. Crafting, for example, just has no sound effect at all and it kind of feels like it should. So that's a lot of information about technical performance. So what are the key takeaways? First of all, I can't comment on console because of the bullshit review restrictions. Ray tracing on PC looks amazing, but it comes at a performance cost that is only offset by DLSS. The game has a steady frame rate, but plenty of graphical and audio issues still to be ironed out. Technically speaking, this game is unfinished, which will come as little surprise to you when you start to see just how bug infested Night City is. So by now you will have heard that Cyberpunk 2077 is a little buggy. I have around 250 clips saved on my PC and around 50 of those are labeled for some kind of bug. So 20% of my clips are bugs. Now that's not to say that 20% of my playthrough was bugged, but it is to say that this is a really, really buggy game at this point. Now I know what's going to happen in the comments section. It's the same thing that happened for The Avengers and Anthem and Fallout 76 and every other game that had buggy betas or pre-review windows. There's going to be an army of people all pointing to the day one patch like it's some sort of omnipotent deity that will descend from the digital heavens and smite all the bugs in one mighty lightning bolt. That's the power of the day one patch. It's that fucking strong, it will fix in one week what hasn't been fixed in seven years, right? No, that's never the case, ever. Games like this are huge, vast. Their code base is inconceivably large. The idea that one patch will fix every single issue that I alone found here in this playthrough is, is laughable. It's not going to happen. I mean, just as one example, during the review window, there was a bug where all the weapons would float in the air whenever we killed a target, right? 
and there was a patch pushed out during the review that was like 50 gigabytes and one of those items was that they'd fix the floating weapon issue. So I load in, I start playing and sure enough the issue is still there. This clip was recorded the day the patch was deployed. It was like the one thing that this patch said it would fix and it didn't. So the reality is that Cyberpunk 2077 is going to be buggy when you play it. Nothing will stop that now. The question becomes how buggy is it and are those bugs so disruptive that they would ruin your experience? For me, they didn't ruin my experience. I still had a fantastic time but they did significantly disrupt my experience and your mileage may vary so let's take a look at some of these bugs. I think on the bottom tier, we'd have, you know, minor bugs. These are things like T-posing enemies, glitched out NPCs stuck in bad pathing, or NPCs figuring out entirely new ways to sit down. When driving, there's this weird recurring bug where your model would sort of T-pose out of your car, or, or if you're on a motorcycle or whatever, just kind of flash into this T-pose thing. Sometimes you'll be in a cutscene with someone and parts of them will just stay suspended in a scene like this floating cigarette here. Often you'll encounter lip syncing issues where characters just aren't moving their mouths. What do you need? Well, we need the pipe fixed, that's for sure. You'll often see people just floating in the air or cars parked rather awkwardly. Next up are your sort of mid-tier bugs, which will mess with your shit and piss you off. For example, I got a recurring bug where the camera would keep snapping down to the ground. The only way to fix this was to restart the game. I got one issue where my shotgun just wouldn't fire, so I had to restart the game to fix that too. I had one where an NPC I needed to kill just wouldn't die because he kept phase shifting. There was a very common bug where you lose the ability to select dialogue options and the only way to fix that was to restart the game. There are a lot of audio glitches where audio just doesn't load in or audio continues to loop after it's meant to end and the only way to fix that is to restart the game. Sometimes interactive items just wouldn't work and the only way to fix that was to reload your checkpoint. The list goes on and on with this category, right? There are just so many bugs that will make you sigh with frustration. The final category of bugs are the ones that are really bad and that really fuck your shit up. Now, there's not too many of these, but there's enough. Most of them relate to quests just not working and you can't progress them. So in this one, I have to follow this cab around and it's meant to do things, but it doesn't. It just gets stuck in this exact spot and the quest fucks up. And this is a quest chain that I now can't complete because of this one bug, right? This mission right here was a great example. So I had to go to this club to spy on this guy and I get there and the mission marker is just pointing to the wall even though there's nothing there. When I go inside, there's no music it's like this weird silent disco thing, but not. So I end up chatting to the guard and he tells me to fuck off and I'm looking around inside for someone else to talk to, but there's just no one there. And I end up going up on stage like, excuse me, have you seen Liam? Eventually I notice a speech bubble somewhere and I follow it and I finally find the bartender. Here he is. He's literally just sitting outside on the street, right? Completely confused, right? So I click on him and he teleports me back to the bar where we conduct our conversation, only he's still outside. So I hear this really distant audio and I see the text appearing at the bottom. He eventually tells me that the dude I'm looking for is upstairs. So I make my way up there, but when I arrive, he's just not there. Like it's clear that he should be there but it's just a broken quest. Separate from all these categories is just the corrosive impact that the combination of these bugs and others have on the core experience. I've given you a lot of isolated examples separate from the main quest line or even the more interesting side quest moments, but so many of the game's most thrilling or evocative moments were upset by bugs. So while a character clipping into an environment isn't game breaking, it's immersion breaking at the exact moment when the game is trying to immerse you the most. I loved being sucked into Night City. It felt so fucking real. So like when this stuff happens, it reminds you that like, oh yeah, this is just a video game. It's a real snap back to reality moment, which is a bummer because Night City is really remarkable. There's a moment at the start of the Corpo playthrough where you have a chance to look out the window of your flying car and just take in the city below. And I remember thinking, what wonders await? Don't make me mad. You will not like me when I'm mad. Oh. 
Did you just eat a fly? Night City is this contorted, sweaty, heaving, opulent, desolate, holy land and house of ill repute. It's powered by pipe dreams and hustle. It's lubricated with snake oil and gilded with fool's gold. It's the silver tooth grin of the Las Vegas card shark meets the illustrated men of the Yakuza meets the press suits and cuffs of the corporate magnates, gazing down from their glass towers at the money-making machine below that is their dominion. Night City is little more than a casino where everyday people gamble with their lives and their dreams, and like all good casinos, the house always wins. The foundation of Night City isn't its jaw-dropping beauty or expansiveness. It's not even the urban complexes and turnpikes that make up its bones. It's the cultures and subcultures that each part of the map represent. It's the inner city slums with its shanties cascading into underdeveloped waterfronts. It's the abandoned urban developments of Pacifica, a monument to the broken promises of capital now ruled over by the Haitian voodoo boys. It's the seemingly endless desert with its solar arrays and truck stops and who knows how many holes out there where who knows how many problems are buried. To take in Night City isn't just to see it for its spectacle and color, it's to feel the distinct identity of each of its boroughs and how they're brought to life through people, fashion, architecture, poverty, wealth, advertising, and the societal structures that you moonlight in and out of on your journey. Night City is massive, and I'm not talking about in that stupid video game sense where they just push the map further and further out to make it look massive. Night City is massive up. Like you're standing on a street corner and you just look up to see skyscrapers and roadways and shopping arcades and billboards and flying cars. No game has ever made me feel so tiny, so insignificant as I walked its environment. Other video game environments feel like they're tailor-made for you, as though they cease to exist when you're no longer there. But Night City doesn't give a shit if you're there or not. Life goes on there with or without you. It doesn't hurt that along with this density and scale comes beauty. Look at this fucking game, man. Night City is unfucking believable This is the best looking video game I have ever played, hands down. No question. Yes, other games are stronger in their minute details, but no game has ever produced a spectacle like this before. No game has made me stop what I was doing and just look around as often as this game stopped me in my tracks. It's just crazy. Even now, I yearn to return to Night City just to be in it, to see it, to cruise it. I would do that sometimes. I would just get in my car and drive, not going anywhere in particular, just driving around, looking at stuff because man look at this fucking game it'll be beautiful just a jump I think my favorite feature of Night City, the thing that really sells me on it, is how dense and multi-layered and rabbit warren-like it is. It twists and turns and snakes and meanders. It's not the Roman grids of Grand Theft Auto's LA or Watch Dogs London. It's a total mess and it feels so much more real for it. You can't press the forward button and just jump over things to get to your destination. You cannot point your car to the waypoint and just hit the accelerator. You need to navigate the streets, negotiate the walkways. You need to move through the city on its terms, which means that you're grappling with it, you're contending with it, you're thinking about it. Video game space is so cheap and meaningless because you rarely have to consider your footfalls. You just stay affixed to the horizon. Here in Night City, every square inch of space feels valuable, utilized, meaningful, because it won't let you through if you don't pay attention to it. It also helps that Night City is just the right size to feel massive, but not so large as to feel unwieldy or redundant. It's the Yakuza model of open world design, where the map completely forgoes any effort to be big and tries instead to be memorable. You'll draw a map of Night City on your head as you play this game. You'll come to know its landmarks and the best ways to move between them. It's a shame then that one of the principal means of traveling, driving, is pretty bad. I mentioned it earlier when I spoke about the controller issues, but even when the controller is working, cars just don't feel great. They feel too floaty and their turn circles aren't nearly responsive enough. This is an even bigger issue because of the minimap. Now this is gonna sound weird, but the minimap fucks driving more than anything else does because it's so zoomed in that if your car is traveling fast, you don't get the advance notice you'll need to slow down for a turn. So more often than not, you're gunning it and you suddenly see that you need to take a hard right turn and then you slam on the brakes and you slide everywhere and you try and regain control of the car and you smash into things, etc. A simple fix of pulling this mini map back would have resulted in a vastly different, vastly better driving experience 
so I hope that can be patched in future. I will say though that there are a lot of cars, many of which I could not afford to purchase due to economic balancing issues, but they all look amazing and they all have their own unique handling profiles, at least the ones that I used. They felt different from each other and they perform better depending on your driving style, from zippy responsive roadsters to slick supercars to off-road vehicles equipped to handle the harshness of the Badlands. I love the cars in this game. I think they're so fucking cool. I'm not even a car person, but I love them. I really hope that some big changes can be made to driving in future because it's a shame that cars that look this good can be so unpleasant to drive owing to physics, minimap, and controller issues. My dad will fuck you up. At this point, you're probably wondering what this city has to offer as a playable, interactive space. And I think the answers to that question aren't as next gen as many would have liked. This is an evolution on the open world map structure rather than a wholesale next generation leap, but it doesn't make it any less enjoyable. Firstly, there's the simple experience of just walking around Night City and observing its people. Like old mate Gary here, modeled on the Twitch streamer Co Carnage, who has some interesting things to say about the powers that be. Do you truly believe that those who have sold you your mechanical eyes have resisted the temptation to peek through them? Cameras are all around us, even within us. Your joys, your worries, your life. For them, it is all mere spectacle. All right, Co, calm down, bro. You can also take in the unique sartorial sights of Night City's self-confident citizens. Watch up. Nothing, man. I just want to say you look great. Then there's just the general chit-chat you'll overhear as you walk the streets, where street hawkers will spruik their wares and working girls will offer you a saucy cutscene for just a few eddies, or disagreements can quickly get out of hand. But that wouldn't get me what I'm owed. Oh, you want to try? Go on, son! Then take my hands! These aren't playable aspects per se, but they are a vital part of this game's overall experience. I fully expect there to be a Humans of Night City Twitter account set up documenting the fashion and back chat and moxie that almost every citizen seems so infused with. Just walking the streets of Night City is one of the most fun things you can do in Cyberpunk 2077, and if that isn't part of the gameplay formula, then I don't know where else to put it. There are spontaneous events that break out. You will be driving along and you'll hear nearby shots where rival gangs are throwing down or the police are trying to bring down a suspect. These spawn randomly at set locations so you can clear them out and drive past them again hours later and find the same shootout taking place. It's very gamey, but it's a video game and it gives us something to shoot at, so let's not overthink it. Beyond that, there's your more mechanical open world stuff going on, like map markers pointing you to various criminal hideouts and bounty hunts. These are marked in blue and will also sometimes respawn after a time, giving you a means of constantly farming experience and eddies by a more reliable means. Next up are the side jobs and gigs. When you step into an area for the first time, you'll get a phone call from the local fixer. My name is Dakota Smith. If you're looking for jobs out here, you will find them with me. These are people who connect clients with mercenaries like yourself, and they'll dish out jobs that always have at least some narrative backbone. In this mission, for example, I'm told to collect a car and deliver it somewhere, only while driving to my destination, I start to hear that there's very clearly someone in the trunk. Let me out! I could either pull over and check it out, or I could just go to my destination, no questions asked. There's quite a few of these side jobs and gigs to get through, and while each of them follow a broad template, the narrative dressing, the changes in location, and the enjoyable combat ensure that they never feel like the sort of open world busy work that these games are often stuffed with. Outside of that, there are a few open worldy style missions like scanning graffiti around the city or street racing or boxing matches, etc. They're exactly what you expect they are. Broadly speaking, Night City looks and feels far more impressive than it plays. It's not possible to point to any aspect of its open world structure and see something genuinely new or innovative, which isn't a bad thing because the look and feel carry it so far. But I think it's important to have the right expectations going in. I think the biggest issue I have with Night City City is that it's certainly not a world of consequences. You can rob people of their earthly possessions as you stand right before them. You can run pedestrians down in the street and the cops will follow you for like, I don't know, 15 seconds before they give up. These are some lazy ass cops, man. The denizens of Night City also can't handle basic traffic, like their cars will just sit there silently if you park in a way that obstructs them. And the cords. I know you'll know what to do with them. 
Fuck. Walking around with your gun unholstered is fine, so long as you're not directly pointing it at anyone. Many video game worlds have felt far more reactive and responsive than Night City ever manages to. Left for Atlanta, looking for a slice of happiness. Guess you didn't find it. Cyberpunk 2077 is a different kind of open world game in the way it chooses to structure itself and tell its story. You play as V, a mercenary who is trying to make a name for himself in Night City when he accidentally manages to get the ghost of Johnny Silverhand stuck in his head. Johnny's been dead for over 50 years and he's still very pissed off at the people he used to know, the corporation he used to fight against, the capitalism he waxes lyrical about and pretty much anything else you can think of. Johnny is an angry, angry dude. With Johnny in your head you have to do some stuff. I won't spoil it, but there are things that must be done and you will do them. Very helpful review. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe. When it comes to the story told here, Cyberpunk had a very high bar to clear owing to the legacy set by The Witcher 3, inarguably one of the best written games in the history of video games. The Witcher 3 had some pretty average combat and its open world stuff wasn't particularly innovative and its RPG systems weren't particularly deep, but the writing in that game was astoundingly good, turning mundane quests about frying pans into gripping sagas, reaching deep into the classical European fairy tales to resurrect the horror that often served as their foundation. Introducing you to villainous, mischievous, noble and eccentric characters that all felt like real people somehow brought into a game rather than fictitious characters imagined for entertainment. But the Witcher 3 could make even the most boring fetch and kill quests worth your time because the writing never knew when to quit. Cyberpunk is a very different beast and I'll be honest in saying that I didn't find it as engaging thought-provoking or emotionally resonant, but I do think there were some standout moments that will loom large in my memory when I look back on Cyberpunk in the years to come. The main reason I connected far less with this story is that I couldn't at all connect with the main character, V, or me, I guess. Now, this is a first-person game and you'll see everything through the eyes of V and you'll select dialogue options and he'll say the words, etc. The idea is that you are the main character of Cyberpunk and you shape an identity through those choices. I think the game fundamentally failed to achieve the goal of making me feel like V and also failed to make V his own distinct character. I never felt like V because I would hear V's voice saying the words and I would hear the words that he chose and they were never the sorts of words that I would choose. There also wasn't much choice in what I could say or he could say or how it could be said. There was typically a chance for me to ask questions but most of the dialogue that would move the story forward was pretty singular. I always felt like I was watching V talk, I never felt like I could speak as V. The flip side to this is that what V does say and how he says it is kind of not great. He has this sort of canned cool guy voice that seems to lack emotional range or empathy. His lines are typically quite transactional, used to drag exposition out of other characters rather than offer his own meaningful contribution. You might think, well, that's how it has to be because it's a first person game and that's how that works, right? But I disagree with that. I mean, The Witcher could have been played in first person rather than third person, hypothetically, and I still would have had the same connection to Geralt because the dialogue options that he had, the things that he said and how he said them, were just fantastic. First or third person, Geralt was Geralt and I'd have listened to what he had to say as I chose from set dialogue options. Of course, Cyberpunk is purposefully trying to let you shape a character in a way that The Witcher wasn't. But even then, I think it's been done better elsewhere. I think the best example of this is Shepard. Now, everyone has their own memory of Shepard. Paragon, Renegade, or something in between. Your Shepard was your own, but he was also just Shepard. There is a character there that exists as a combination of your choices and the inherent personality of the character. That inherent personality is totally missing here with V. He's, he's really quite vacuous. And without that anchor, I found a lot of the game felt adrift. Now I'm gonna say something really controversial here that no one is gonna agree with, but here we go. Keanu Reeves was miscast in this role. Now I love Keanu Reeves, we all love Keanu Reeves, but there's a reason we love Keanu and that's because he's a fucking nice guy. Wholesome value over 9,000, right? Johnny Silverhand though is a proper asshole, like narcissistic, misogynistic, violent, egotistical, self-righteous, self-destructive. 
He's kind of like this Hunter S. Thompson brand of questionably intentioned truth-sayer and freedom fighter. His brand of gonzo terrorism goes well with women and whiskey and writing edgy lyrics about the decadence and decay of the system that everyone's trapped in but no one can see. Keanu tries his best to capture this sort of unrelenting rage and disgust at the world order, but I don't think he quite sells it. Do whatever it takes to stop him, defeat him, gut him. If I gotta kill, I'll kill. Still, as a vehicle for storytelling, the presence of a dead terrorist rocker boy in your head works really well. Johnny's presence isn't limited to a few specific main story quest lines. He's deeply embedded across every part of the game, popping up in main quests, side quests, and just while you're walking around doing your thing. Hey, hey, V, wait a sec. Listen to that guy. How'd you read his chops? Now this is a good time to talk about how cyberpunk is structured. You're probably imagining something like The Witcher 3 or Assassin's Creed Valhalla where there's this big long main quest and a whole bunch of optional side quests along the way. But the main quest is this meaty 50 to 60 hour affair. Sorry to burst your bubble, but no, cyberpunk's main quest line can be completed in as little as around 15 hours. I know this because that's what my brother did, basically. He finished the game in 17 hours doing a little bit of side content along the way. Now I know there's alarm bells ringing right now, but don't worry because my brother will freely admit that that is the wrong way to play this game. There is a right and wrong way to play cyberpunk, and if you're planning on just doing the campaign, then you're really just ruining the experience for yourself and you may as well not bother. The right way to play cyberpunk is to recognize that its absolute best content is the side content because this is the content that connects you to an absolutely unforgettable cast of characters and shuttles you through events far more exciting than most of what the main campaign has to offer. Cyberpunk feels fresh and unique because its side content structure feels indistinguishable from its main story, except for the fact that these stories sit in a different spot in the menu. These are not brief dalliances designed to drag you unwilling into the open world, they are multi-stage quests that build upon themselves based on the decisions you make. They could end with a single dialogue option at any time, or they could continue right up to the final credits of the game, as some of these side stories will directly open up entirely new endings for you. And they aren't like slightly different endings, they are massively different and they are only available to you if you spent the time with each of these characters, getting to know them, becoming friends with them, and should you choose, falling in love with them. Some of these side stories are absolutely brilliant and confronting and emotional and just fun. Like The Witcher, much of the legacy of this game will be owed to these completely optional detours. The pacing and delivery of this side content is one of the most innovative aspects of cyberpunk. The chapters of these stories all unfold so unexpectedly as you await a phone call or a message from someone. You can be on your way to the ripper shop to get some upgrades when all of a sudden Judy calls you to tell you that she wants to meet. In that moment, your plan have changed and the next hour or so you'll spend with the game you never knew that hour was coming up you can't really plan or prepare for what cyberpunk throws at you and in a genre where it's possible to see a map or a quest line and extrapolate your experience the simulated spontaneity of cyberpunk is invaluable the biggest disappointment i had with cyberpunk story and writing was that the world and the stories within it didn't really intrigue me in the way that I had hoped. I love sci-fi. In particular, I love the futurist vein that underpins the best of it. Like, what happens to faith in a world where no one has to die, like in Altered Carbon? Or what sort of life is there in the adult-minded bliss of Soma in Brave New World? Or how does humanity reconfigure its geopolitical structures when an omnipotent entity like Dr. Manhattan walks among them? Good sci-fi makes us consider the impacts that technology will have on our environment, or spirituality, or relationships, or our bodies. Cyberpunk 2077 sadly does not really do that. I'm not saying the game needs to endlessly sermonize or hypothesize, but I think I would have enjoyed it more if it was willing to dig deeper into its source material and force us to imagine how different life could be in the year 2077. I mean, the recent rise of VTubers has got me thinking more about the future than Cyberpunk 2077 did, and with a canvas as rich as this, that feels like a very big missed opportunity. <laughs> Cyberpunk is not just a story-driven open-world game, it's also an RPG, one that allows the player to design and customize their character, augment them with cybernetics, arm them with an array of futuristic weaponry, overcome challenges in a variety of ways, and make meaningful decisions that will affect the world around them. It's my view that Cyberpunk 2077 is an absolutely exceptional open-world action game, but it's just an okay RPG. 
as a lot of its RPG elements seem to exist for their own sake, with little chance to feel the impact of these RPG choices through distinct gameplay loops. First of all, yes, you can customize the look of your V in a variety of ways during the character creation process, but people who really love creating characters are going to find this somewhat limited. There aren't the sort of body and face molding tools that allow you to create very distinct and potentially hideous looking creations. Instead, you can expect the character creator to offer a wide range of preset options. There are plenty of options here to create a unique V, but you can't like recreate yourself or something like that. You probably don't want to hear this, but it doesn't really matter what your V looks like because yeah, this is a first person game almost exclusively. I can count on a few fingers the number of times I saw my character other than in the menu or when using the photo mode. So putting hours of work into crafting a really unique V probably isn't worth it anyway. The much bigger problem with customization is the way that this game handles clothing. When I started picking up clothing and seeing that it had armor stats on it, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, surely there's some sort of transmog system in place that lets me keep my stats but customize the look of my character as I see fit. No, that's not the case. If you want to use the best gear you have, then you have to expect that you will look like some kind of fluoro-inspired trash can hobo with random mismatch items just thrown together. It was a bit of a bummer. When it comes to character progression, there's quite a bit to keep track of. There's character level, which gives you some basic stats and attribute and perk points every level. There's also street cred, which you get for just playing the game really, mainly doing side content. It maxes out at level 50, and I know that because I reached level 50, and there are rewards along the way, like you know new jobs and new items at vendors and new quest lines that open up. The attributes give you a variety of different core stats, but they also serve as a requirement for certain points in the skill tree. So if you want to get the higher level handgun skills, then you need to have invested the requisite number of attribute points in reflexes, simple stuff. The skill trees are a really mixed bag. So first of all, I really like how you gain skill points. You gain them by doing the thing. So if you kill someone with a handgun, you get handgun experience. And when you get enough of that, you get a skill point to spend. You don't have to put that skill point into handguns, mind you. You can put it wherever you like. So you're sort of encouraged to use different weapons and abilities and skills since this is the fastest way to gain access to as many skill points as possible. The problem is that like so many other aspects of this game, the economic balancing of this is just bad. I basically mained a handgun, like my entire 50 hour playthrough, and I've maxed out my street cred, and even then I still have not progressed any more than level 11 out of level 20 for handguns. I've done more than my fair share of stealthing as well, and I'm still only level 6. I did plenty of quick hacking too, and I'm only level 7. There's not much more for me to do in this game, but the calibration of these skill points tells me that I'm like halfway through the game, less. It feels like the game is just way too stingy with this part of the XP curve. Now I chose to focus firstly on the crafting tree, which you can see here I maxed out and I maxed it out really fast. It was like the first thing I did because I'm like, yeah, cool. I'm going to make so much cool shit. This is going to be great. Nope. Terrible, terrible idea. Worst possible decision I could have made. The entire crafting economy is completely fubar because the availability of materials is just so bad. To craft blue level items, I need purple crafting components and I don't get those until after the point where blue items stop being interesting to me. And by the time I can make epic purple gear, which needs legendary materials for some reason, I'm picking up legendary items. So I'm no longer interested in crafting purple epic items. It is possible to convert lower tier material into higher tier materials and you're seeing like these stockpiles here in my inventory but these exist because I'm at the very end of the game. I've I like finished it and then I went and did like an additional 25 or 30 hours of side content right. I did not have these stockpiles playing through the game more broadly and at no point was I ever able to craft anything that was more useful to me than what I was picking up off the ground. So the whole crafting economy and the availability of patterns and the actual items I could craft were just, it just, none of it, none of it worked. To be honest though, it actually wasn't that big a deal because I soon learned how weak and inconsistent the gear game within Cyberpunk is. I really imagined that they'd go with a more narrowly focused gear game that was about modifying weapons with meaningful upgrades, tweaking their performance over time, applying specific status effects that fit my playstyle. That's not the direction CD Projekt Red went at all. Instead, they've essentially gone for a looter shooter style system where loot is constantly dropping and it's constantly an upgrade, so you're just churning through your gear mindlessly because DPS is the only stat that matters. 
You can mod your weapons with ridiculously pointless mods like scopes that increase your ADS time by 0.06%. I mean, what the fuck is that? I can increase weapon damage by 6 when the weapon does like 500 damage or something. It's, it's ridiculous. Now, I don't know if maybe there are all these other mods that become available after you've cleared every marker on the map or something. But like I said, I've maxed my street cred. Uh, there's not much of this game left for me to play and none of this gear game has been anything other than just kind of a bit of a waste of time. The saving grace is that the weapons themselves, the way they look and perform, are actually fucking awesome. There's three categories. There's power weapons, which ricochet bullets. There's tech weapons, which shoot through solid objects. And then there's smart weapons that auto-target your enemies, resulting in some awesome bullet-bending antics. Picking up a weapon in Cyberpunk and firing it is actually awesome. A lot of people had concerns that the combat here would be shitty because, you know, it's an RPG and they would kind of half-ass the first-person shooting. No, Cyberpunk 2077 doesn't have Doom or Call of Duty or Destiny level mechanics, but they're better than a lot of other shooters you've played. They are absolutely no slouch whatsoever. While the shooting is great, I think the overall combat framework isn't as interesting and as flexible as I'd hoped it would be. Outside of the shooting, there's the stealth, which is full of really dumb, really blind guards who you can make even more blind by casting your cyber spells on them. The quick hacking stuff where you can overload people's cybernetic implants or turn turrets against enemies. It's all there, but most of the combat spaces don't have a lot of this going on. Let me put it this way. I just played through Watch Dogs Legion. Its version of hacking and environmental manipulation was vastly more sophisticated than what Cyberpunk has to offer. And it was also something you would kind of naturally go to. Here in Cyberpunk, that stuff isn't fleshed out quite enough, so you don't naturally want to go there. You sort of have to force yourself to roleplay the sneaky dude or the hacker dude, all the while knowing that Blasting everything with your weapon would have been more efficient and probably more fun to play. I don't want to completely write off the RPG side of this game, but much of it feels like it's there because it should be rather than because it needs to be. These vast skill trees are a really good example, I think. The fact that I'm only halfway through one tree, a quarter of the way through two others, and there's dozens of unused nodes everywhere, even though I finished the game, is a testament to the fact that a lot of this just isn't required. You might say, well, no, this is this just means that the next playthrough, I, you can invest in completely different skills. And yeah, sure, like next playthrough, I could go an assault rifle build and, you know, just put more points into hacking or whatever else. But I don't think the combat experience would vastly change as a result of that. For replayability, I think Cyberpunk relies on the sheer thrill of being in Night City or making different choices during the major quest events. I don't think it relies on compelling RPG choices that materially impact your playstyle. Now this has been a pretty mixed review at this point and you're probably scratching your head like, how could you say that Cyberpunk delivers when you've listed all these problems with it? It's a fair question and the answer is that the parts that work within Cyberpunk, the density and the immersiveness of Night City, the sheer beauty of it, the characters you meet, the choices you make, the spontaneity of your adventure, the emotional peaks, the soundtrack. My god, I haven't even spoken about the soundtrack. The soundtrack is fucking incredible, by the way. Cyberpunk didn't achieve everything it set out to achieve, but the things it got right, it got really, really right. And that's the thing, right? Like, your favorite movie isn't your favorite movie because it has the best cast, the best acting, the best lighting, I don't know, the, your favorite movie is your favorite movie because it probably got a few things right that just really clicked for you, right? I think Cyberpunk 2077 is the kind of game that is just greater than the sum of its parts, such that if you fall under the spell of Night City, few of the game's shortfalls will mean much to you in the end. Having said that, this is an unfinished game. There is obviously the technical performance issues that I raised, and the horrendous bugs, but there's also some work to do on fundamental aspects of the game's item economy and RPG systems. We can certainly expect bug fixes, they will happen, and in three to six months I'm sure that most or all of the problems I've listed here won't be a problem. City Project Red have a true commitment to quality and I have every faith that they will get this game to where it needs to be. But unlike most single player offline games, I also expect that City Project Red will work on rebalancing and rebuilding some of the game's core components. I'm sure we can expect some sort of transmog system for our character. I'm sure we'll see an overhaul of the Eddies economy so we can afford to actually buy cars 
instead of just driving past them. That's something I didn't mention, by the way. You basically can't afford to buy anything in this game. It's ridiculously expensive. I'm sure the entire mod system will be tweaked and rebalanced. I'm sure the crafting system will be pretty much ripped out and replaced. More than any other single player game I've played, I feel like Cyberpunk is at the very start of its update path and the game you play in 6 to 12 months from now will be vastly improved compared to the game's launch state. And that's the bottom line really, it's a question of how patient you are, about how badly you want it. If you have eagerly awaited the arrival of Cyberpunk, counting the years, months, weeks, days and hours, then you should buy Cyberpunk and I have little doubt that you'll enjoy yourself despite these issues. But if you have the restraint to wait, I do recommend doing so. This game and Night City are far too special an experience to be interrupted and undermined by the issues that currently undermine this game. Part of me wishes I was among the people who pick up the game for the first time a year from now. All its parts fully finished and shining like a brand new Quadro Type 66 Avenger. Regardless of when you pick it up, you're in for a once in a lifetime experience. And you can't say that about many games. This video was brought to you by the Eno 3D range of RTX 30 series GPUs. And if you haven't looked into how much of a leap this next generation of cards are, then you really should. Put simply, this next generation of Nvidia GPUs are to PCs what the PS5 and Xbox Series X are to consoles. They make 4K gaming actually possible where before you had to turn down too many of your settings to keep your frame rate up. More importantly, they also make ray tracing a reality, something that was just beyond the reach of the previous generation of cards since the performance cost was typically too damn high. If you're not familiar with ray tracing, it's a vastly better and more realistic way of producing lighting in games. Things like reflections on metals or glass or on puddles on the street. Before, developers had to manually manipulate light, which was both time intensive for them and never as authentic as it could be. With ray tracing, light is simulated through an algorithm, meaning it bounces and reflects in more ways than was possible before. Scenes in games like Watch Dogs Legion and Cyberpunk 2077 are utterly transformed through this sort of tech, and it's hard to go back once you've experienced it. The 30 series cards make ray tracing possible through not only raw processing power, but through something called DLSS, or Deep Learning Super Sampling. It's sort of hard to explain, but the long and the short of it is that it uses your GPU processing power more efficiently, giving you more headroom to enable more graphical settings, including stuff like ray tracing. I played Control with DLSS enabled, and it literally doubled my frame rate when I had ray tracing turned on. If you haven't got a 30 series card yet, I really strongly recommend checking out the Inno 3D lineup, specifically their RTX 3080 iChill X4. In addition to out-of-the-box overclocking and programmable RGB, it also features some of the most advanced cooling of any RTX 30 series card, including a side rotor fan for added airflow. I have one of these cards since Inno sent me one, that's what I review my games on now, and it's just a complete game changer. I mean, I went from an RTX 2080 Ti to this, and even then the results have been huge. If you want the absolute best performance out of your PC, then there's really no better upgrade you can make. To learn more about ray tracing and DLSS, check out Nvidia's website, and to grab yourself an Inno 3D RTX 3080, check out their website. I'll leave links in the description below. Thanks to Inno 3D for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.